Good morning. I'm Ted Burkhart. Uh, I'm an engineer at Basho. We make React. Uh, I tinker with the Erlang VM, actually. I've done a lot of that before I got into this uh, conversion process and some other things. Um, playing around with the Erlang VM internals and trying to use them to our best advantage. So a lot of people have asked us about getting React off the current version of OTP that it's on and onto something at least a little bit more current. And I'll try to fill you in on the adventure that that has been. So um, a brief agenda. These are roughly the things that I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> I hope it'll be straightforward as we go along. I'm going to do my best to allow a few minutes for questions at the end. Uh, I expect that some people here may have more in-depth questions. I'll be around for the remainder of the conference if you want to pull me aside. Uh, we're going to do a question and answer thing at the 255 break down on the 10th floor later on, which is not specific to this, but questions are welcome. So there are basically two flavors of React, KV and TS. KV is the basic uh, key value data store. And TS is a time series data store. TS is a newer product. Uh, it shares a lot of the back end with KV. But I'm going to focus mostly on the KV side, uh, since that's where the current effort to get onto a current version of OTP is focused. Uh, TS will come along after that. And in fact, that's part of the plan, is uh, after we get KV, then we merge the TS stuff with the KV stuff to come out with one consolidated product that runs on current OTP. We'll see how that works. <clears throat> so as most of you know, React's a NoSQL database. It's uh, based on Amazon's uh, Dynamo model. So it's widely distributed. It's highly resilient to network partitions, hardware failures. It's very scalable. And of course, it's written in Erlang. So getting into what goes into React, uh, it's mostly open source. We have an open source version and an enterprise version that has some additional goodies added in for paying customers. Um, most of what I'm talking about here is just relates to the open source. The enterprise version just is more of the same. Uh, it's comprised of, depending on how you count, 60 or so GitHub repos. Maybe I should turn off the sound on my phone. <clears throat> Roughly a third of them are now forks. Uh, they weren't always. We used to use them out of their originators repositories, and we'll get into that in a little bit. And there are, again, depending on how it's configured, uh, roughly half a dozen NIF libraries that are implemented in C and in a couple of cases C++. And a couple of those are pretty substantial. So the current 2x series runs on Basho's own fairly heavily modified version of R16, um, which is obviously a few years old. We're up to the 10th iteration of it. Uh, and I've avoided uh, doing any more revisions to it since 2015, although our product managers were just asking me last week about, hey, there's this cool new feature in OTP 19. Can you backport it to R16? And we're just, no. No. <laughs> we only support 16-bit Intel processors, which allows us to uh, make some modifications that wouldn't necessarily be compatible with other platforms. So we've been able to add some per performance improvements, um, and we've done a lot in the SSL area to tighten up security there, uh, mitigate poodle attacks. Um, we have actually backported some resource leak patches and other stability patches from later versions of OTP. Uh, we've made some separate um, revisions to handle malformed certificates more gracefully. Uh, and there's some other odds and ends in there. Uh, but the bulk of it deals with performance and SSL stability. And as I said, I'm trying really hard not to modify that code anymore. and we have paying customers. So it's a database, and they'd really like it if we don't lose their data. <clears throat> so 
So we have to be a little bit cautious about what we change and where uh, to make sure that we don't lose or corrupt data that's stored in it because that's the sort of thing that gives databases a black eye. So a little bit about Basho. Um, we're not a huge corporation. We have ongoing product releases to address customer requests, things that we know we can improve, and of course, trying to attract more customers. Uh, so we also have finite resources because we're not huge. So we can't just throw 100 people at this or at any particular feature. So I actually get called off onto other things as well, which, is, which adds some delay into the process. It's unfortunate, but it's the way it goes. So moving React to the next version of OTP uh, or something after that should be easy, right? Maybe not. So in 2014, OTP 17 came out. We looked at it and thought, we should see if we can move to that. Now, mind you, at the time, there were still some people who were, were still having like night terrors about the move from R15 to 16 in the React code base. <laughs> <coughs> and they, they were a little bit jittery about this whole thing. Uh, but that winter, we put, a, put together a plan to do that. The idea was to maintain backward compatibility of the source code base so that the same production source tree uh, could be built on 16 and 17, and that would allow us to uh, compare performance and behavior and things like that, regression testing. We still had a lot of R15 compatibility in a lot of the source repos because we were still supporting a previous uh, LTS version of React, the, the 1X series was still supported at that time, and it ran on R15. And the plan is we'd use compile time com conditionals, um, preprocessor macros, and that would give us the ability to perform regression testing and all that good stuff uh, and keep the source tree compatible. So that meant we were going to keep the same build structure uh, as we had in the current branch, which was based on rebar 2. Uh, using make files to glue the steps together because Rebar 2 couldn't really do as much stuff as we needed it to do. Rebar 3, of course, was in its infancy then, um, so it wasn't anything we were ready to build our production systems on. Uh, and there was also some debate going on whether we might want to transition to the Erlang.make based build model. Luckily, we avoided going down that particular rabbit hole long enough for it to become moot with Rebar 3's subsequent adoption by Erlang. <clears throat> I took on the task in the winter of 2015, and I wound up creating OTP 17 branches in dozens of repositories. We attempted to use third-party repos where they sat. In other words, uh, if we were using somebody else's repo, we didn't fork it, we tried to use it directly because we wanted to, the, the the theory is that you know if somebody makes an, a, a fix in their in their repo, we want to we want to pick that up and pull it in. <clears throat> and we tried to work around issues as they came up with compatibility macros, you know things like the namespace type macro that you've seen everywhere, uh, and left the leftover R15 crypto compatibility because that API changed in 16, and there was a lot of stuff left over for that. So I was plugging along through it, and I started to realize that maybe it was a bigger task than we originally thought. <clears throat> so what went right with it? Well, the compatibility macros in the repositories we had control over worked out okay. Uh, for the types that had moved into namespaces, we were able to handle that without too much trouble. You've all seen how it's done, probably. Some of the API changes, uh, we handled at runtime instead of compile time. Uh, for instance, Erlang System Monitor was extended in 16B01, uh, but because of preprocessor limitations, uh, it was easier to detect it in runtime and adjust the configuration accordingly than it was to uh, conditionalize half of a J 
Gen Server module. The change to UTF source, UTF-8 source code uh, got a little hairy at places because we do have some places in the code, especially in tests, but in the main code as well, where we beat the system pretty hard with Unicode characters, and it took some work to get those modifications uh, to all those pieces working together correctly. What went wrong? We were too optimistic in our planning. You've all done that. There's no two ways about it. Uh, building with the hodgepodge of make files and rebar scripts, especially pulled in from those third-party repos, was pretty painful at times. As I mentioned before, rebar 2 could handle steps for us, but not sequences. Um, so we still wound up with make files, some of which were not pretty. And as I just talked about, Erlang's preprocessor is actually pretty weak. Uh, if we could conditionalize at the line of code level, uh, or even distinct function heads, as opposed to the entire function, it make things a lot easier. And using the third-party repos in place turned out to be a big mistake. Uh, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more. We also found that we had more technical debt than we realized. Uh, you can call it skeletons in the closet or dirty laundry or whatever you want. Any large body of code has stuff in it that you're not proud of. When you pull stuff in from third-party repos, you don't necessarily have any control over what's in them. Those may not be technical debt of your own making, but you still have to pay the bill. Uh, so there were a lot more things than we realized starting out. <coughs> <clears throat> now, mind you, this is only for OTP 17, and as we move forward to 18, 19, and 20, uh, there's a lot more that comes up, but we're still a couple of minutes away from that. <laughs> I'll get into the, uh, the second item, dependency hell, shortly, but the basic idea is that it's really hard to manage dependencies in a large graph of interdependent repositories. Uh, and data encoding. This was one we didn't see coming at all, and it caused us a lot of pain. The issue was that in R16, the default encoding was Latin 1, and in OTP 17, the default encoding changed to UTF-8. If you wrote some terms using the I.O. library's uh, P format in Latin 1, it could potentially put characters in the output file that when you read them in in the default of UTF-8 would blow up the parser, take down the process that was doing the reading. <clears throat> we, um, we had cases where we were storing configuration and status information as terms in R16. And when we read them back, it took down the process. And of course, the key here is to write an encoding marker into the file or to write them with the W format uh, but these were files that had already been written in customers' databases. So we, that kind of blindsided us, and it was obviously a backward compatibility issue that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, what we wound up doing was standardizing on writing with the W format specifier um, and hoping that we can get everybody converted over so that when we release on a UTF-8 based version, none of those files will still be left around. That's what we're hoping. <clears throat> so the end result is, gee, maybe this isn't as easy as we thought. This is a recurring theme. Um, you'll see the recurring theme of skeletons in the closet, but there's a, a lot of stuff under the covers that we just didn't realize we were facing when we tried to do this. Now, at the same time we were trying to do this, um, we, of course, had product delivery pressures, and it was clear that it was too difficult to get the product onto OTP 17 when we thought we could. So at the time, OTP 18 was just out, and it obviously had significant differences, even from 17, much less 16. And we realized that things weren't going as planned with 17, and maybe we should step back, get caught up on some of the product features, and regroup with a better plan in a little bit. So we did get back to it. Late in 2015, 
And by the spring of 2016, uh, we'd come up with a new plan, figuring that OTP 19 would probably be the target. Even though 18 was current at the time, we were learning that this was going to take time. And we were a lot more pessimistic in our planning. We realized that we really needed a strong definition of exactly what it was we were trying to accomplish. So the plan we came up with was all of the repos would be in the Basho org. If it was a third party, we'd fork it so that we could make whatever modifications we needed to and protect ourselves against anything going away. Uh, because of somebody closing their account on GitHub or making a repo private or who knows what, uh, we actually have experienced source code vanishing off GitHub overnight. Uh, and we were lucky in the past, really lucky, in that I had just cloned that repo the day before. <laughs> uh, but we didn't want to leave it to luck in the future. The OTP 19 target was going to be strictly rebar 3. <clears throat> rebar 3 was viable at that point. It was apparent that it was the way forward. And we weren't going to use rebar 2 or make files or rebar config scripts. We were going to make a clean break. And we were only going to target OTP 19. Uh, we weren't going to try to maintain backward compatibility with 16 or any other previous release. <clears throat> now, odds are that when we're done, we'll probably be compatible with OTP 18. I have not uh, hit anything that I've felt we were going to have an issue with between 18 and 19. But we're definitely not going to be compatible with 17 and certainly nothing before it. So as part of the pessimistic planning, we went into it with eyes wide open and said, OK, there's technical debt we're going to run into. On my previous pass through the repos, I had gotten an eyeful of a lot of them. <clears throat> and we've got to take it on head on. We can't dance around it. So obviously, we're not going to fix everything that we don't find to be perfect about our and everybody else's code bases. But for the stuff that really needs to be fixed, we're going to fix it rather than trying to work around it. Uh, we're going to do something about the dependency hell, and I will get into that. And to the extent that we need tools to do the things we need to do, we're going to build the tools. Uh, initially, we thought that we'd write some custom scripts, but I think the solution we came up with is actually a lot better. So for React on OTP 19, the definition of done is that it builds to release with rebar 3. It means we're going to employ relics instead of rel tool and some of the other pieces that we have cobbled together. Uh, we still don't know for sure how much pain that's going to entail because we haven't gotten all the way up to the top of the stack yet. Uh, we're going to have consistent dependencies. You'll see this subject. You've already seen it coming up over and over. That's because we want the definition of done to include that all the dependencies are consistent and that we have a way to keep them that way. We also want it to pass all of its system tests. So we have some tests that are not as deterministic as we'd like them to be. Given the nature of the system itself, you know, it's an eventually consistent system. Does that mean that eventually all tests pass consistently? We, we don't know yet. <laughs> um, but it's conceivable we'll still have some that are, that we have to average, you know, a number of runs and say, did it pass at least 60% of the time or something like that? Because with eventual consistency, you don't have a guarantee that the value in, in, uh, <clears throat> in one node is going to be the same as the value in another node at any given point in time. And uh, in order to get those tests working consistently for some definition of consistently, we're going to take on the technical debt rather than, again, rather than just dancing around it. So that was the top level for React. So for every single repo, uh, we, wanted to be con we wanted a conformant rebar 3 build. In other words, we wanted a cookie cutter pattern that we knew would hold in every repo that we were working in. We wanted true consistent dependencies, not just consistent in that they all 
use the same version of a given repo, but that they all tell the truth about what they depend on. Uh, the rebar config file in both rebar 3 and rebar 2 is a static configuration. It's not actually based on what the code depends on. It's based on what you tell rebar the code depends on. We wanted clean XREF and dialyzer runs on everything, absolutely everything. Uh, if we get any warnings out, we want to find out what's causing them and fix them, or where we have to adjust options for those specific functions where it's appropriate to do so. The, the dialyzer attribute that was added in OTP 18 is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, there are some places where we can't even do that. <coughs> Mech comes to mind. <coughs> and uh, where we want React to pass all its system tests, we want each re, uh, repository to pass all of its unit tests consistently. So, patterns. Rebar 3 has profiles. Yay! It's a wonderful thing. Uh, this is something that's been hacked around in rebar config scripts, in make files, environment, environment variables, um, phases of the moon, for all I know. It's just, there, there's a wide variety of ways that people have addressed these, um, and they all kind of suck compared to just using profiles. So we decided to use a predefined set of profiles, um, some of which are assumed by Rebar 3 and some of which we've just standardized on. This is basically the list. Uh, for every repository we're touching, we have a prod profile. Now, that's the, you may or may not know that when you build a dependency under Rebar 3, that's, effective, that's the implicit profile that's used to compile it, not for the project you're working on, but for the things it depends on. <clears throat> um, we have a check profile, which is just like prod, but it forces uh, debug information on the, the current build and all its dependencies and adds XREF and dialyzer configurations, fairly extensive one. Uh, the test profile that's the default for EUnit, CT, cover. Uh, we also add a pulse profile where we have uh, pulse tests. There are a couple of repos where we do. Uh, and it basically is an extension of the test profile. Uh, we have a docs profile, pretty straightforward. Uh, it's the default for the EDOC target. If there is example code, we have an example profile, and we have this validate profile that I put in right in, at the beginning, which is basically a torture test. Virtually nothing passes it. It turns on every warning as, uh, and, and does a str strong validation. So it doesn't actually generate beam files. It doesn't stop the compilation when it hits them, but it fills your screen with warnings over just everything that you might have done that wasn't 100% perfect. <clears throat> dependency hell. Um, so I keep mentioning this, and what the hell am I talking about? So dependencies often have transitive paths to them, uh, multiple transitive paths. They depend on other dependencies and on down the chain. So each place those dependencies are declared, they generally have an explicit version specifier, uh, a tag or a branch or a commit sometimes. Uh, and if they differ, Rebar can tell you about it, but it doesn't really give you much in the way of help about getting them matched up. Uh, the first one it encounters is the version you get, uh, and everything else has to live with it. So ideally, you want to use branches for development, so you're always getting the latest work, but that's a moving target too. Uh, the Rebar 3 gives you a little help with that with the lock command. Packages aren't going to save you. Uh, they're fine for stable code, but when they're up to date. Uh, but you're often working on multiple interrelated repos, at least in the, in the React model, where we leverage a lot of other repos. Um, so you're often actively developing in a number of repos in, in parallel. And you really need to be getting the heads of their, excuse me, respective branches as you go. So I'm, I'm making a modification in uh, React Core. I may go, I'm changing the behavior of some API. I may then go over to React KV and make a change in there. I've got all these things in my checkouts directory. It's, it's not realistic um, 
to suggest that I can that I can use packages for that. A couple of examples. Uh, in the open source version of React, there are four other repos that depend on React Core. <coughs> there are seven repos that depend on Logger, and there are ten that depend on Cuttlefish. So this is a graph of the React 2.2 open source dependencies. Uh, I know you can't read it from where you're sitting, that's not the point, to give you an idea of the complexity. Uh, in fact, it's not even entirely accurate. Uh, the true picture is worse. I cleaned it up some. Um, I, I actually took out some of the stuff that I've already taken out in doing the rebar three conversion. <clears throat> but in this version, there are still undeclared but necessary transitive dependencies. And you remember I said there were 10 dependencies on Cuttlefish? It's Cuttlefish over here. You'll see it better in a minute. Inside that red circle is Cuttlefish. More of those 10 dependencies. Uh, it's only showing you three of them. Those are the ones that are declared in rebar config files. The other seven are implicit, where a package assumes Cuttlefish will be there because one of its eventual dependencies listed as an explicit dependency, and that is a pretty big assumption to make. You can imagine what happens when something somewhere down the tree is changed, uh, dependency is removed, or maybe it no longer needs cuttlefish, that's not actually likely to happen, but, uh, but something that depends on it still does need it, and the whole thing blows up. This actually gets even worse when you add our various testing tools into the mix many of them um, are guilty of the same sins of, of relying on implicit transitive dependencies that aren't actually declared where they should be. Uh, if, if, for the C programmers, uh, you learned a long time ago that if you use a function in your file, make sure you include the header file in that file. Don't rely on somebody else including it. This is exactly the same sort of thing. So maybe we can do something about that. As I said earlier, we originally thought that we'd come up with some scripts to try to rein this in uh, and some other problems, rein in this and some other problems. But the more I tinkered around with things, the more I realized that we could do it all in a Rebar 3 plugin. <clears throat> so I created the Basho Rebar Tools plugin, which I'll refer to as BRT. Uh, it's on GitHub, it's a plugin for Rebar 3. It works on every version of Erlang from R16 on, including 20, or today's version of 20. <clears throat> I test it rigorously and frequently to make sure that it works. Uh, that's primarily for 20, which is a moving target. So some of the things it does are, it uses XREF throughout. Um, to figure out what the true dependencies are of the code as opposed to what the rebar config files say the dependencies are. So that information is then used to generate rebar config files. It's also used with a top level configuration of the dependency versions um, so that it can regenerate or update rebar config files so that everything that uses a particular dependency uses the same version of it. So basically, I can hit a button, go down through the tree, make sure everything that uses logger is using the same version of logger. <clears throat> Has support for Git commands and the GitHub API, so it can do things like helping us synchronize to upstream repositories where we fork them, um, and doing things across trees of Git repositories. Uh, it generates various supporting files for us. Uh, it actually mainly uses rebar three templates, not for the rebar config file, but for a lot of other stuff. But they're wrapped in simplified commands to get the right variables set to the right values. The, the basic idea is that it supports our workflow, which isn't necessarily your workflow, but I think it's a decent example of how you can use plugins in rebar three to help you with your workflow. So that rather than uh, having something on your internal wiki page that tells a developer, here are the steps you follow to make sure that um, your Rebar 3 config file is in, is in sync or your 
uh, here's, our, here's our standard git ignore file for a repo or something like that. It just has a, a rebar3 command that you run and it does the right thing. So we don't have to worry about what version of a tool is installed or whether the developer went and looked on the wiki page or where the tools are installed. It's all included, it's all up to date, uh, but it's very much a work in progress. It's, st it's, it's very stable and it's been proven to be a good approach, but uh, there are a lot of things I want to extend in it. We also have another tool we use called Thumbs. We use this outside the, the Rebar 3 stuff as well. Uh, it's not unlike Travis CI with some GitHub PR workflow handling built in. Um, so when somebody creates a pull request in a repo, it'll run through a sequence of build steps. If they all pass, uh, it can, well, build and test steps. Uh, it can then enforce some review policies and help us avoid merging broken code into mainline branches. It's been very helpful in that regard. It's, as I said, it's more general purpose than BRT, and it's enabled in most of our repos now. Uh, among the supporting files that BRT generates are the thumbs configuration files that go into all the repos as I convert them, or as we convert them, because it's now more than just me working on it. And as we all know, tools work best when lubricated. This is my preferred lubricant. <clears throat> so is it done yet? Nope. Uh, I had hoped to be able to point to some beta-like version of React on OTP 19 by the time I gave this talk. Uh, that didn't happen. It turned out to be more labor intensive than that optimistic target, but I'll note that uh, I'm still within our pessimistic target goals. <clears throat> so BRT is stable, thumbs are stable. Um, at last count, which is changing on an almost daily basis, last time I counted, 31 repos were done on their first pass. And what I'm defining as their first pass uh, is even though the definition of done doesn't include backward compatibility, to the extent that we can, we're trying to keep them backward compatible at this point, simply for regression testing and performance comparison, things like that. Uh, once we know that, every, so we're not trying to keep them production grade backward compatible. We're just trying to keep them enough so that we can tell we haven't veered too far off from what we should be doing. Once we know we have everything working, uh, then we're gonna strip all that conditional code out so that we don't have to maintain it going forward. Uh, most, possibly all, of the third-party repos are done. Some of those were pretty challenging. Most of the NIFs are done. Uh, maybe one left that hasn't been done. Uh, but I've switched them all to make files where they had previously used the Rebar2 port compiler. Uh, I was able to come up with some, uh, with some, with a pattern for a C and C++ make file. Uh, the targets our platforms more accurately than either the port compiler plugin or the CMake template in Rebar 3. Uh, I may make that itself into a template in BRT, but with the current NIFs pretty much done, there's not a lot of pressure for that right now. We're very close to getting it, getting up the stack to the React KV repository. That's the big target. React Core is done. If you're familiar with the structure of React, React Core is pretty much the heart of some of the, uh, a lot of the underlying components of the system. Uh, it was non-trivial to get that done. I actually removed at least one module that I think had been copied directly out of R13 into it. Um, <clears throat> so Core is done, KV is the next one. It's, it'll be the big one. Once we get past that, it should be pretty smooth sailing. Uh, until we get to the part about building with relics and, and getting rid of some of the funky stuff that we do to actually build a release of React at this point. Um, so we're getting pretty close. Even though I previously said there were around 60 repos and I just said that a little over half of them are done, the half that are done are the harder ones for the most part. Uh, it, it gets easier as we move up the tree. 
especially with the patterns ironed out, some of the repos literally only take a couple of hours at this point to get them up to speed. Uh, it frequently takes longer to run them through the, all of the builds and tests that we want to be sure pass than it does to do the actual conversion because a lot of that conversion is done by these automated commands that we've added to rebar 3 with the plugin. Um, of course, some of them like Rhea KV are going to take weeks, but uh, it's getting better. So what have we learned? Lots and lots of things. Uh, there's some truly ugly code out there on the internet. <laughs> we, all, we all knew that, uh, but some of it's uglier than we thought. Some of it's ours. And if you're managing a repository with a significant amount of code in it, some of it's probably yours. <clears throat> it's, it's not all other people's code. Um, as we've worked up the stack, we've gotten a lot more aggressive. We're not timid at all about what we're willing to do to a repository at this point. When I started on this, I was trying to tread lightly, uh, keep my changes as minimal as possible, you know, don't rock the boat any more than I not needed to. The hell with that, that's out the window. Um, <clears throat> there's, there, there's very little I'm not willing to entertain as a possibility at this point. Um, one of the targets for me is uh, a, a repo that only has one thing depending on it, and when I look, that dependency is very narrow. Um, that's something I want to consider, just removing the dependency altogether. In some cases, just a single module, maybe even a single statement, uses some additional repo. And that's, that's pulling a whole repo into our, into our tree, into our maintenance burden. Uh, it's often a lot easier to work, rework the code so it just doesn't need that external dependency. Uh, removing it altogether uh, is, is a lot easier than, than keeping it as an ongoing maintenance burden. In other cases, we were pointing to repos that didn't do what the calling code assumed it did, either because the caller made an incorrect assumption about what the callee claimed to do, or because the implementation of the callee didn't do what the callee said it did. Um, and again, it was easier to fix the, code, the, the calling code, remove the dependency, than to convert the repo it was calling into. Comments, 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 comments. So Rebar, uh, React has been around for quite a while. Um, lots and lots and lots of people have worked on it. Um, some of them have been like feverish midnight coding sessions and they've just blasted out this code and you, ha you look at it and you're going, oh my God, what does this do? Comments really help in cases like that. Folks, I cannot impress this upon you enough if you're doing something really strange and weird and, you're, and, and wonderful in your code, throw a comment in and say what it is. Uh, a huge amount of time in this process has been spent trying to figure out what a piece of code does. <clears throat> um, it's also, it's, it's changed the way I write code too. I mean, when I'm writing a piece of code, I throw comments in because I have encountered this enough times now that I say, I don't want anybody else to, to deal with this and my memory's not getting any better. I may come back to this ne next week and not remember what it was supposed to do myself. Um, so, like, take changing from the random module to the rand module. Uh, their APIs are very close, uh, but there are some subtle differences in how they do things, especially with regard to the uh, random number generator seed. We actually came across tests that depended on the static initializer in the random module. I don't mean they depended on it being a static initializer. I mean they depended on the specific integers that were in that initializer. <laughs> a comment in that particular code would have saved me days. <laughs> Saying, you know, what you're doing, why you did it, justify why you did this. Um, the, it, that particular one, uh, I won't forget that one soon. <laughs> uh, and if you're not doing it already, track your technical debt. Um, 
we've all got places in our code where we did something and said, gee, if I just had more time to spend on this, I could make this so much better, or you know, a week later, you're farther up the stack and you say, oh, I wish I had implemented that differently. Put it in your bug tracking system as a go back and look at this or a to-do or something like that. Um, we've taken to adding everything we, everything we encounter in the stack. If we don't fix it, we put comments in the code and we put it in our bug tracking system saying, hey, there's something flaky over here that somebody may want to go back and look at at some point. Um, those are really the high points. Uh, I could go on and on, but I want to give people a little bit of time for questions. Uh, and as I said, I'll be around and there will be a Q&A later this afternoon. So, any questions I can answer? Yes? Uh, implementing changes on them in your version, in your org, right? Mm -hmm. Do you send pull requests back to the original output? Uh, it, we need to in a couple of them. A lot of the things that we're changing are just the build configuration. In other words, we're getting rid of the rebar 2 build and converting it entirely to rebar 3, and we don't figure that that is necessarily something that they want to adopt right now, to abandon. We've made the corporate decision to abandon rebar 2. Not everybody else has. Uh, but certainly, uh, in the areas where, uh, where we're finding bugs in code, uh, in a lot of cases at this point, uh, there are, in a couple of cases, we've already done the PRs and they've actually been pulled into the upstream repo. Uh, in a couple other places, we've, we've made notation in our bug tracking system to uh, go back and see if there's some part of this we can extract to make a clean PR for the upstream repo. But yeah, we definitely, uh, there, there are repos out there that, that could use the help. How soon do you think React will be available on, on the public then? <laughs> <laughs> Given that, um, so I've been, uh, basically I've been on this for on and off for over two years. Um, and 100% of my estimates been, have been off by potentially orders of magnitude. <laughs> I would really like to be able to say that within the next month or two, the open source version of React would be running on uh, OTP 19, but uh, I, I certainly would not want to commit to that. I mean, it's, it's going along well. It's a lot more work than originally estimated. On the other hand, our original uh, our original pessimistic estimate, basically I gave the most pessimistic estimates I could. Um, other people contributed by like multiplying those, um, as, which is the only reason we're still within the window. Yes. Uh, We, we have not yet. I really want to. That's one of the big things I want to get off of. That's one of the mistakes, uh, one of the fundamental mistakes we made, I think, when we were uh, planning the OTP 17 stuff was the idea was we don't want to adopt maps because we want to keep the backward compatible code base. But especially with some of the improvements that have been made to how maps work, i.e. bug fixes in subsequent uh, releases, you know, the idea of being able to match, to do pattern matching in a function head on the contents of a map, that's really, really appealing. I mean, the performance difference, yeah, that'd be cool, but it's being able to match in a function head, oh, I really want that. <laughs> yes? Um, so, I deal with this all the time where you're, you've got, you know, three, four levels of deep of dependencies all checked out, and you're making a change to that last one, and it, you know, it's kind of difficult to change. Yeah. Using that code locally, you know, without having to go back and you know, you change back all your all your dependencies down the line. Checkouts directory 
is your friend. <laughs> the checkouts directory is wonderful. You just put it so so you've got uh, you've got a, you, your directory your your my my development directory. Um, you you check out the repo you want into that. It's it's a peer of the one you're working in. You put a checkouts directory in the one you're working in and a symbolic link back to that. Or in my case, you just put make some checkouts as a symbolic link back to the whole freaking tree. <laughs> because I'm working on 20 repos at a time. <clears throat> it's it's great, and then you simply do one without the checkouts directory, and it pulls everything down, and you see if it actually does what you thought the whole mess was going to do. But it's um, you know I used to work in in Rebar too. I worked in the depth directory all the time, and I had all of them had sim links, you know, back to their parent directory. You had circular links all over the place, and it was a mess. Um, the, the checkouts directory makes life easier, and and that's one of the things I addressed with this uh, with this rebar plugin was, as I said, to support our workflow, basically my workflow, and and other developers can say no, I'd rather do it this way, and then we can have that discussion about okay, we'll we'll make it do it that way, but you know, basically I was sort of forging this path, and I said, gee, it'd be nice if it did this, it'd be nice if it did that, so I made it do those things. And then I throw it out to the Basho developers and say, you guys like it? You want it changed? What do you want? Um, you know, it's an iterative process, but by having it, as a, um, having it as a plugin that gets automatically pulled down, you know, when you, you check out a repo, you have the tools to work on the repo. And uh, this checkouts model is... Um, No, checkouts isn't my my idea. It's built into Rebar three. <clears throat> I don't know which who's who's responsible for it, but it's good. Oh, I saw some things in there. What's that? I saw some lines in there. So All right. Whatever. But <laughs> that's the best kind of code. Somebody <laughs> stole from somebody else. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, been there. You know, uh, pre it used to be, I used to consider myself a pretty accurate estimator. But on the other hand, uh, I, haven't, I haven't been in the React, there's still areas in the React code that I just don't understand at all. I don't know how those features work. I understand on a conceptual level what they do, but I haven't been into the code to see how they actually work. So, you know, there are areas where I'm going into code that I've never seen before. And, gee, surprise, surprise, it's worse than I thought it was. <laughs> what are you going to do? 